So it's now 9.30, so we will kick off. And I will forego lengthy introductions, although each of our speakers this morning deserves a lengthy introduction. And I will hand over straight away to Lukia Athanasaki, who will be talking to us about the um, art, text, and lyric performance. So, is this on now? Can you hear me? Uh, in the microphone. Uh... Ah, okay. Uh. I would like uh, to thank the organizers for the invitation to this conference that looks into the past and into the future in a self-reflective mode. With regard to the main question, the future of the past, it has been abundantly clear that classics is useful both as a positive and a negative example, depending on the individual and social values of different people and periods. Despite the inherent danger of generalizations, it is fair to say that the male-dominated ancient world has been studied by successive male-dominated societies, even if they differed from one another. Social differences point to different receptions. My aim today is to look at divergent receptions of women's roles in the archaic and classical musical scene. Specifically, I will focus on ancient perceptions of female choruses, and I will argue that our evidence, scant and fragmentary as it is, shows A, that both the archaic poets and the ancient students acknowledged the important contributions of women to the song culture, and B, that the realization and appreciation of women's role is obscured and essentially written off by the image of Melic poets as divinely inspired composers of words only, an image that persists even now, despite the interpretative strides in Melic poetry made already in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s by performance and gender studies. When we focus exclusively on the surviving words at the expense of performance, however, we lose the audiovisual component of Melic poetry, and as a result, we underestimate the important role of the performers. There are reasons for the exclusively text-oriented approaches. The loss of melody and choreography are obviously serious obstacles. But the gains of holistic approaches are far greater than the risks involved in reconstructions. In the interest of time, I will focus on Pindar's 6 p.m. and I will explore the dynamics of relations between male and female choruses against the background of the Delphic artistic context. Before turning to the pian, however, I want to look at some ancient writers and scholars who not only took account of the audiovisual component, but reconstructed several aspects of the artistic process. The most celebrated example is, of course, Philostratus's reconstruction of one of Sappho's hymns to Aphrodite. This is handout number one. And I don't know why it doesn't scroll down here, but. I have no time to do justice to this amazing description, but 
I wish to draw attention to the subtlety, subtlety with which Philostratus treats the issue of male, of male, malic authorship. The emphasis of the ekphrasis is clearly on the performance of the hymn as it evolves in time and space. Philostratus captures Sappho in her role as Korodidaskalos, probably at a dress rehearsal. The chorus are praised for their beauty, their costumes designed to facilitate their movement, their sweet voices, their dress, and their nimbleness. Only one chorus sings off tune, uh, receives spe uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, the coro di Daskalos uh, puts her back in tune. Finally, Eros, who has turned his bow into a lyre, is said to remember and play a specific melody. In all likelihood, he remembers the score that Sappho composed along with the words and the choreography. The ekphrasis catches sight of all aspects of Korea, but privileges the melody and the spectacle. It is worth noting that the female chorus are praised both for their natural, natural beauty and their artistic accomplishments. It is also worth noting that Sappho is depicted performing together with Eros. The image corroborates the reception of Sappho not as the ninth among the best male poets, but as the tenth among the lovely muses, and the epigram from Greek anthology is number two in the handout. Altman's claim to fame were his Parthenea. An epigram foregrounds Altman's female choruses described as nightingales singing female songs, and this is handout number three. Elius Aristides, on the other hand, draws attention to the inspiration Altman draws from his choruses by pointing out that the chorus has become Alkman's muse, and this is the text in number four of the handout. These are only a few examples of the importance attached to all aspects of musique in the ancient world. In a paper that seems to have appeared on the internet, but not yet in print, and this is a handout number five now, I argued that Pindar extends the traditional model of the poet and his muse by including the characters in order to account for the divine quality and allure of the choral performance as an authoritative audio spectacle. From the point of view of the female performer's contribution, which is my focus today, singing and dancing like the muses is an integral part of an authoritative audio spectacle. What I shall now do is have a fresh look at the sixth pian and contextualize Pinder's take on Delphian female choruses. And this is text number six. I will read the translation. In the name of Olympian Zeus, I beseech you, Golden Pytho, famous for seers, with the graces and Aphrodite, welcome me at this full of God's time, the songful prophet of the Pierians. For having heard by the water from the bronze gates the murmur of Castalia, devoid of men's dancing, I have come to ward off helplessness from your kinsmen and from my own honors. For in heeding my own heart as a child obeys his dear mother, I have come to Apollo's precinct, nurse of crowns and feasts, where young women of Delphi often sing and dance little song at the shady navel of the earth and beat the ground with rapid foot. It is a great pity that the text breaks off at this point, but we are very lucky indeed that the last four lines have been preserved.
The opening of the pian has been much and well discussed, especially after Giambattista D'Alessio's discovery that the last triad was marked on the papyrus as a prosodion. This is the reference in our, uh, handout number seven. The discovery has given rise to some very attractive hypotheses of which I mention only one possibility of a joint performance by two choruses, one Delphian and one Ezainitan, put forward by Leslie Kirk, and this is a reference in uh, handout number eight. In Kirk's scenario, the first two triads were sung by a Delphian chorus stationary at the altar, the last triad by an, by an Ezainitan chorus as they proceed to the altar. Now, I'm going to go very fast to the reconstruction of the facade of the Temple of Delphi, just to make clear that... So this is the facade of the temple. There is an altar right in front. So the idea is that the chorus, uh, during the sacrifice, performs around the altar, at the altar, uh, which is right in front of here. Um, For our purposes, it is important to note the similarity between the male choruses description of Delphi and female choruses and the description of the second pian, and this is handout number nine. In a related description, the male chorus of Abdiritans evoke female choruses singing and dancing in Delphi and Delos. Here as elsewhere, and this is remarkable from the point of view of gender dynamics in choral lyric, it is male choruses who evoke the performances of female choruses, divine or mortal. In the interest of time, I will focus on the two pians and explore the communicative strategy of these hymns and its premises. I would like to preface my discussion with a theoretical framework drawn from the field of cognitive deixis and specifically the branch studying discourse and text worlds and reference in handout uh, number 10 I quote from page 21. Because text world theory takes the commitment to experientialism seriously, it aims to provide a framework which is fully context sensitive. This means recognizing the potential that both the immediate physical surroundings and the participants' background knowledge have to, to affect the discourse process. But what is the specific nature of this knowledge and how can we examine the impact of such an apparently abstract notion on everyday discourse in a systematic way? In fact, the participants in any given discourse world will normally be making use of several different types of knowledge at once. Understa understanding what those different types are, uh, different types are, is the first step towards understanding their effect on the discourse process. The types of knowledge that Pindar could take for granted in his audience was theoric experience, hymnic tradition, and visual representations. To begin with Abdira, an Ionian colony, the poet could reasonably expect that as Theoroi, several members of his audience would have seen performances of the Deliades at the Panionian festival on Delos and of the Delphides in the Panhellenic sanctuary of Delphi. Pindar must have expected his Abdiritan audience to know the celebrated description of the performance of the Deliades in the Homeric hymn to Apollo, but there must have been many more hymns commemorating the charm of the Delian maidens. 
Finally, an abundance of vast representations of female choruses would enable the audience to picture the dance of the Diliades. Since divine choruses, such as the Muses, the Graces, the Seasons, etc., were thought to be paradigmatic of mortal choruses, we do not need to posit visual representations of the Diliades, although they may have existed. Finally, it is worth stressing that both the Pian and the Homeric hymn to Apollo bring out the superb quality of female choral performances. An essential difference between the second and the sixth Pian is that the chorus of the latter evokes performances that take place exactly where the male chorus is performing at the altar in front of the temple of Apollo. And we have seen the facade. Although the chorus evokes recurrent performances, it is possible that the Panhellenic audience of this Theoxenia had already seen the Delphides in action. As in the case of the Delian chorus, Pindar could count on his audience's personal experience, but also acknowledge uh, I'm sorry, something is, has... Okay, acknowledge the surroundings. I have already mentioned that the female, that the male panic chorus performs at the altar, that is, in full sight of this pediment of the Alcmeonid temple, for the inauguration of which Pindar composed another song dance, the Eighth Pian. The part of the Pian that must have praised at the Alcmeonid Temple has not survived, but fortunately a substantial part of the pedimental sculptures have, thus enabling us to read the Sixth Pian against its artistic background. And I want to show now this pediment, and then I will show what is uh, on exhibit under, uh, in Delphi. Let us first look at the widely accepted reconstruction of Pierre de la Côte Messelier. Apollo's first horse chariot occupied the center of the pediment. The figure of Apollo has not been found. At the left of the equestrian complex stood three female figures at the right, is, uh, sorry. And in the corner, a lion attacking a, 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 a deer, a, 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 bull, a bull, I'm sorry. At the right uh, side of the Apollo uh, chariot were three youths, uh, and we have a, a Sorry, we have the female, you, you can see, so I'm sorry, now I, something has gone wrong with my text here. The scene has been interpreted uh, as, one, a timeless epiphany of Apollo, and B, as his advanced advent and installation in Delphi. Interpretations that read the scene as Apollo's installation in Delphi fall into two categories. According to the dominant interpretation, the scene represents Apollo's installation in Delphi with an escort of Athenians. This interpretation has been challenged by Clemente Marconi, who argued that the scene depicts Apollo's arrival not from Athens, but from the land of the Hyperboreans. In Marconi's scheme, the archetypal arrival scene mirrors the annual celebratory reception of Apollo in Delphi upon his return from the Hyperboreans. Depending on the interpretation of the central theme, the female and male figures on either side have been variously identified. Athenocentric interpretations identify the youths as Athenians. The female figures have been identified as Athenian maidens or even the Agloids. Non-Athenocentric interpretations have identified them as muses 
or as Delphian maidens who participate in the yearly celebrations. If we take another look at what has been preserved, handout number 13, it is clear that the scene does not offer definitive support to any of these interpretations. In an earlier reading of Pindar's seventh paean, I have entertained the possibility that the scene was more or less generic. An unmarked representation of Apollo's arrival in Delphi and the ensuing celebrations could facilitate both as Athenocentric readings, such as Pindar's Pythian 7 for the Alcmeonid Megacles, but also yield Delphocentric perspectives. And the reference is not in the handout. I can give it later if you want. I would like to pursue this line of thought further and have another look at the male and female figures. The two female figures and the one male figure are too fragmented to allow certainty as to their posture, but the arrival of the god suggests incipient celebration, which is the case of groups of three, uh, which always point to, or almost always point to dancing. By Kilidis 16, this is number uh, 11 in the handout, uh, gives us precious evidence for that. I read the translation. You come to seek the flowers of Pians, Pythian Apollo, all those which choruses of Delphians loudly sing at your glorious temple. Pindar's sixth paean reflects precisely the recurrent choral performances of the daughters of the Delphians in front of the temple of Apollo and invites his audience to look at the pedimental sculptures and correlate them with the performance as it unfolds in the here and now. Such a correlation would bring to the surface an important feature of the pedimental representation, namely the equal standing of male and female groups in the celebrations of Apollo. By projecting the, themselves onto the conspicuous marble pediment, the male chorus evoke the gender dynamics of the sculptural representations thus emphatically affirming the equally standing and indispensability of female choruses in Apollo's sanctuary. This is a layer of meaning that is lost if we de decontextualize lyric poetry and overlook its fundamentally performative nature. We have seen that ancient writers and scholars did not lose sight of the performative and contextual aspects, despite the fact that more often than not, they too focused on the text. The tradition of the divinely inspired poet is as old as the tradition of the poet as song maker and choral master. To quote James Kugel, again, the reference is not uh, in the handout, it, uh, it was left out by accident, but it is his book, uh, a collection of essays, Poetry and Prophecy, Cornell University Press. I quote, anyone acquainted with the Western literary tradition knows that some of its greatest poets, Dante, Milton, Blake, have in one way or another viewed themselves and presented themselves to the world as endowed with prophetic gifts or divinely inspired speech. Such figures were themselves the inheritors of an earlier tradition associating poetry with prophecy, one that winds back through the Middle Ages in Christian Europe and Muslim Spain and the East, and back, and back still further to ancient Greece and biblical Israel. This tradition hardly speak with one voice. 
Today, by contrast, I have tried to foreground the voice that acknowledges the indispensable contribution of female courage to a divinely inspired audio spectacle. In addition to the seminal contributions of Bruno Gentili, Claude Calam, John Harrington, Gregory Nash, Eva Stelle, Susan Lancer, and others, I have drawn inspiration from the recent work of Josina Bloch, Joan Connolly, and Anastasia Peponi, who have done much to uncover the importance of women's contribution to religious and artistic life. I believe this is a fruitful, a fruitful path for the future of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very rich paper, Lucia. I'm sure there will be questions. Don't be shy. Yes. Yes, ja Jacqueline. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a question of very naive. Um, the, girls, uh, the girls dancing and singing, uh, it is in... Um, um, in ritual act, um, they are um, associated to a cult. But what about Sappho and the girl around her? It is possible to imagine that girls are thinking and dancing, <laughs> more or less, mm -hmm. her performing her, her songs, mm -hmm. but not in a cultural way, but uh, also in other way, I don't know. What does mean? Uh, the, the poetry of Sappho seems very intimate, intim, and no. It's the poetry of love, to love to for women. So, it is possible to to imagine that this kind of song could be performed in an informative way, not in a cultural way, in an official way? Yes, yes. I, you see, I, in the interest of time, I didn't make a clear one thing, that when I use the word ritual, I, need it, I use it in an extended sense, not in a religious sense. So when I use the word ritual, it can be far less secular, like the symposium, for instance. It is a right, and I, um, I insist on that. So in this sense, we have philostratus that co constructs a religious ritual setting, but we could have another uh, writer, we don't have this writer, but we could, where, you know, the, the setting would be less uh, religious and more secular, Although our evidence shows, you know, that the secular and religious in ancient uh, Greece, it is a very, very hard distinction, you know, because even the symposium begins with hymns to gods. So, uh, yes, I think, you know, uh, it is easy to argue what I've argued, because we have something that has been excavated, you know, and we have some evidence to begin with. But I am sure, you know, that if we go to our text, and I must say I have not done a thorough research, we will find these things, you know. It is a matter of looking at uh, these things. I am sure they will emerge in the tradition, although we won't have, you know, as much as the male tradition. I mean. The Thank you. We've got time for, perhaps for one more quick question or point. Um, perhaps in that case we'll move on because time is pressing today. Thank you so much, Lucia. Thank you. And now we move on with great alacrity and enthusiasm to Tonio Hulscher from Heidelberg, who will be talking to us about the rise and fall of public monuments. Oh, okay. You'll be talking about something else.
Well, so good morning. Um, ah, of course. Many thanks <coughs> to the organizers also from my part. Uh, of course, speaking on this venue <coughs> is a great experience to me. And I do it in memory of the uh, <coughs> unforgettable Dimitrios Pandemalis, uh, the former director of this wonderful museum, who passed away <coughs> two months ago. Now, <coughs> there are two basic accesses to history, fundamentally different from each other, which we have to distinguish before we ask whether and in which sense classical antiquity is or will be of any relevance for present or future societies. The first access is history as the founding authoritative origin of the present. In this sense, historical traditions of one's own society are regarded as the fundament of its present state, conveying by its old age authority and legitimacy to the heirs and the inherited positions of this cultural, social, and political tradition. History, in this sense, serves to create identity. The upholders of this approach look into a classical past as a mirror in which they try to discover, if not themselves, so at least some fundamental aspects of themselves, the roots of their own essential cultural equipment from which they expect to understand themselves and to legitimate their models of cultural practice. So the Greeks <coughs> did and had already this and that. This is not my concern. Uh, for first, <coughs> we should know ourselves sufficiently by our own critical life experience. So <coughs> our alleged doubles of the past will bring us little new knowledge and insight about ourselves. History as a mirror is basically tautological. Second, the past can by no means provide us with legitimation, for social and cultural practices are either good or bad as such, but they don't gain any authority by their traditional past. Third, and above all, the creation of identity, which is the purpose and the result of mirror history is in itself a highly problematic aim, as I will try to argue in what follows. The counter, counter position to this perspective is history as a window. It means looking out from our own house of culture towards other ways of cultural life, past as well as present, near as well as distant, with curiosity for other societies and cultures. It means, instead of self-concerned identity, <clears throat> taking a critical distance from the self, opening one's eyes for alternative ways of life, and developing creative imagination for new forms of social and cultural practice. This is the perspective I will adopt in this paper. Now, <clears throat> when I was asked <clears throat> for a contribution to this conference, I propose to speak about the actual problem of how to deal with public monuments of our own past in the light of how the Greeks and Romans dealt with their monuments. Yet, when working this out, I came to no unequivocal convincing results, and so I changed to a related topic. I'm going to address the problem of collective identity, starting from the present, going back to classical antiquity, and turning again to our actual problems. Now, problems with identity. Since two generations, the concepts of identity and alterity have become basic categories of historical analysis. An important general approach to these categories was worked out in the Freiburg project Identitäten and Alteritäten, led by Hans-Joachim Gerke from 1997 to 2003. Nevertheless, there remains a worrying proliferation of these categories. The term identity is booming in a totally uncontrolled way in titles of books and articles. Uh, from pottery to warfare, there is no subject that could not be subsumed under the cover of cultural identity. 
In general, there are three problematic tendencies. First, identity and alterity have increasingly become ubiquitous passepartouts for all kinds of cultural qualities and differences <coughs> that they often more conceal than explain. Secondly, a pronounced awareness of collective identity is assumed throughout world history without asking whether it means a universal anthropological constant of mankind or historically differentiated phenomena of specific societies. <clears throat> Thirdly, more or less consciously, every society or social group is granted an absolute moral uh, <clears throat> right to its unbreakable identity. In doing so, historical societies are often judged by today's standards. <clears throat> These assumptions imply various general questions that seem not to be given sufficient attention in <clears throat> historical research and which, last but not least, have consequences for our own cultural habitus. In what follows, I will argue for a critical approach to these terms, and in this I feel encouraged by some authors who have argued in the same direction. The German historian Lutz Niethammer, in his book Kollektive Identität, Die heimlichen Quellen einer unheimlichen Konjunktur, from 2000. The Italian anthropologist Francesco De Motti, in his volumes Contro l'identità and L'ossessione identitaria, and the French philosopher François Julien under the title Il n'y a pas d'identité culturelle. And they have found little attention because the zeitgeist is blowing in a different direction. As for myself, I'm going to argue for two different objectives. First, a precise terminological definition of what we can usefully mean by collective identity. Second, an analysis of the fundamental goals and effects of positive and negative implications of collective identity. Our first definition. In order to clarify the meaning of identity and alterity, it is necessary <clears throat> to make a clear distinction between a descriptive and an ideological meaning. On a first level, individual beings, <clears throat> as well as uh, collective entities, constitute themselves by some sort of objective factual sameness against otherness. In collective communities, this sameness manifests itself in their common material culture, common social practices, and common cultural concepts. In this sense, identity is a descriptive category of what we may call a community's repertoire of cultural resources. For the sake of terminological clarity, I would prefer to speak of a community's cultural profile or cultural system. <clears throat> On a secondary level, identity and alterity signify an emphatic subjective consciousness of the self, whether individual or collective, in essential opposition to the non-self. Identity in this sense is the explicit answer to and the conscious concept of what this self not only is, but what it intends to be. And it makes the unconditional claim to the fundamental rights of this self. On this level, the self is no longer objectively described, <coughs> but intentionally privileged from its own perspective. From this perspective, the other becomes a negative counter-image of the self. In this sense, identity is a category of ideological construction. Descriptive difference becomes intentional alterity. By this emphasization, the concepts of identity and alterity develop a strong potential of political and social dynamics. Now the effects. Emphatic identity is far less innocent than it may appear. By its claim for its rights, it generates attitudes of defense and forces of aggression. Hitler's crimes <clears throat> were an excess of identity. Today in Germany and elsewhere, 
conservative voices advocate national re leading cultures, light culture of identity with foreseeable consequences. Right-wing extremists appear under the name of identitarians <clears throat> and from the Near East to, to Ukraine, conflicts and wars are fought in the name of emphatic identities. But also on a more general level, concepts of identity imply worrying social con uh, prospects. In the middle of our societies, identity is exclusive. Those who do not belong to the group of identity are not only different others, but ideological aliens. <clears throat> and this potential of exclusion is even enhanced by founding identity on concepts of cultural memory. For those who do not possess the same cultural memories, Turks in Germany, and everybody can imagine uh, <clears throat> similar situations in uh, their own countries, have no access to the prevailing cultural identity. Moreover, identity implies always a latent tendency towards conservative rigidity. Identities claim permanent validity, staying identical with and true to oneself becomes an almost unquestionable eth ethical value, independent of its content. Thus, identity of persons and communities has become an almost sacred anthropological right that is founded on emotions and largely eludes rational criticism. Of course, communities must be based on common values, but these values uh, should be based um, on uh, rational choices, not on predetermined postulates of <coughs> irrational identities, be they German, Western, or otherwise. At this point, a basic question arises that is rarely reflected upon, <coughs> and that is whether identity and alterity in this emphatic sense are universal anthropolog anthropological categories or specific states of aggregation of specific historical societies? Do we risk projecting our own self-perceptions and our actual social problems onto former historical societies? Today, we live in an age of the selfie. The photograph of the self is the technique, the technique of an obsessive, almost pandemic habitus of self-concern, self-centeredness, self-assertion, self-determination, and self-pity. At first glance, this might seem to be a private matter of individuals and groups, but the inherent danger in this is the dissolution of social solidarity. For solidarity, <clears throat> in its true sense, is not limited to one's own group. Thus, identity is the counter-concept <clears throat> to solidarity. Regarding history, we should, ask whether <clears throat> we should ask whether the questions, who am I or uh, who are we, was so much at the center of social and political discourses in all societies of the past. And if at all, whether they were asked and determined the social and political practice in all situations of life, couldn't it be that former societies had mostly other problems than who they were, and that they lived and acted in many situations or even in entire epochs, not on the level of emphatic identity, but on that of functional um, cultural practices? At this point, we may turn to Greek uh, archaeology, where we find an instructive broad spectrum of cultural attitudes um, from wide openness to fixed identities. In general, archaeology is a difficult field for discussing such questions. For archaeology disposes only of material objects that do not reveal how they were valued by their historical users. Ah, yeah. To give an example from recent history, Coca-Cola was imported in the 1920s from the USA to Europe as a trendy beverage. In 1949, however, it was forbidden in communist uh, China, 
and soon afterwards boycotted by French leftists throughout the East Bloc and in the Arab League as a symbol of American capitalism, while by now it is accepted everywhere without specific significance. Now, archaic Greece. Material objects from foreign cultures get their meaning not from their intrinsic essence, but by cultural and ideological attributions. And identity versus alterity is but one of several <coughs> uh, options. In 8th century Athens, an Athenian nobleman was buried with a bronze bowl from Phoenicia with incised figurative decoration. If we ask for the cultural significance given to this object to its Greek owners, various different explanations could be given. They could have been appreciated, <coughs> these uh, owners, the bowl because of its economic value, its social prestige, its aesthetic beauty, its figurative themes, its material durability, or its uh, <coughs> um, practical form. But how far an opposition between Greek and alien culture, or even a concept of identity, played any role remains totally open. There are remarkable um, <coughs> testimonies of cultural permeability. From the 9th century BC, Greek drinking vessels were exported to the Levant. At the <coughs> multi-ethnic Emporion of Almina, they might have been used by Greek merchants for Greek-style banquets. But in cases of single finds in interior Syria, this is very improbable. Certainly, these sporadic finds cannot be taken as testimonies of Greek cultural identity. <clears throat> At the opposite end of the Greek world, we find a flourishing symposium culture, at the Merchant's Emporion of Ischia Pithecusae, with the famous inscribed <coughs> um, uh, Nestor cup with its Greek inscription. Possibly these Greek symposiasts felt themselves to be Greeks in some way or other in face of merchants from other regions. But uh, Greek drinking vessels were also found in a prince's residence at Torres Atriano in northern Lucania, where indigenous <coughs> uh, elites celebrated great banquets without apparently assuming any Greek identity. On the other hand, and quite generally, the extensive reception of cultural goods from the Orient, fr from the alphabet and mythology to the practice of banquets and to countless forms of artistic imagery and material equipment, led to an enormous change of Greek culture but had nothing to do with Greek identity. I'll skip the next slides. Uh, in fact, the Greeks were very much interested in the provenience of their cultural objects. They appreciated helmets from Corinth, uh, Corinth craters from Laconia, marbles from Paros, textiles from Ionia, purple from Phoenicia, Silphion from Cyrene in Libya, bronze from Tartessos beyond Gibraltar, but significantly there is no difference made between Greek and non-Greek products, and certainly not between cultural identity and alterity. The relation between Greece and other Mediterranean cultures in the Archaic Age should not be conceived in terms of identity and alterity, but of participation. As Jonathan Hall has powerfully demonstrated an explicit consciousness of Greek identity or of Greekness and alien alterity developed only rather slowly and only came to full fruition in the Persian Wars. Now the creation of new forms of emphatic identity in the Greek in the Great Persian Wars of the, fifth, of the early 5th century <clears throat> has been extensively analyzed, first by Edith Hall in her book Inventing the Barbarian of 1989. 
From her title, it becomes evident that emphatic identity is not a pre-given anthropological constant, but <clears throat> a result of cultural, social, and political construction. As Hans Joachim Gierke has shown, the Greeks <clears throat> developed from this identity their power for defeating the Persians. But on the other hand, <clears throat> they also laid the foundations to the <clears throat> eternal conflict between East and West that continues to this day. Uh, the relevant phenomena are well known. Greeks and non-Greeks are conceived according to a general cultural, ethical, religious, and political uh, antithesis. This antithesis is armored by a strong cultural memory of mythological precedents, such as the conflicts between the Greeks and Amazons, Greeks and Trojans, etc. And it is materialized in symbolical cultural objects, <coughs> such as the courageous Greek lance versus the cowardly bow and arrow of the Persians, or the virtuous Greek body versus the effeminate dress of Orientals. Fortunately, however, things are not that easy. For the Greek thoughts, the Greeks' thoughts, attitudes, and pra practices were often ambivalent and varied greatly in different cultural and social contexts. First of all, the attitudes differed in different media and their specific social situations. Around 460 BC, <clears throat> the Battle of Marathon was depicted in the great public painting of the Stoa Poikile as an achievement of heroic patriotism under the protection of gods and mythical heroes led by Miltiades and other glorious protagonists. Shortly before, Aeschylus brought his tragedy, the Persians, to the stage in which he made the defeat of the Persians at Salamis the subject of great empathy <coughs> from the perspective of the Persians themselves. And at the same time, painted vases for private symposia describe <clears throat> the victory of the Greeks with blatant violence and even with metaphors of crude homosexual abuse. Secondly, <clears throat> the real interrelations between Greece and Persia developed in different ways in different areas of life. <clears throat> in the realm of politics, the rifts were deep. And in the realm of lifestyle, the Greek ideal of virtuous simplicity was constructed in, <clears throat> in, in, in strong opposition to Persian luxury. <clears throat> the entire world could be seen as divided between Greeks and Persians. But at the same time, trade between Greece and the Levant via Cyprus conti <clears throat> continued without interruption. <clears throat> In the field of science, the high esteem of expert knowledge from the Orient was maintained. And in the field of religion, no divide was created between Greek and foreign gods. The ideological antithesis of identity and alterity remained confined to political and social life. In other sectors of life, the former openness remained. All political attitudes had partial validity in different areas of life. Further ambivalences <clears throat> occur in the course of time. The constructed <clears throat> counter-image of the Orient could be remodeled under new historical conditions. In the generation of the actual battles, races depict fierce fights of triumphant Greeks against weak and defeated enemies. <clears throat> Around the middle of the fifth century, however, when the war had <clears throat> come to an end, and the Persians are recognized in vase paintings as pious worshippers of the gods. And in the end, at the end of the century, when the Greeks themselves adopted the ideals of luxury and felicity, the luxurious lifestyle of the East is highly valued in Athens and elsewhere in Greece. This is a process of great psychological complexity. When the Greeks in the early fifth century 
and developed their new ideals um, of um, their, their new ideal self concept of normative simplicity, they projected the negative counter concept of a luxurious lifestyle onto the persons. Yet opulence and luxury, habrosyne, had been the highest values of the leading classes in Greece itself until the Persian Wars. Thus, the new image of the Persian others was, in many respects, a suppressed self-image of the Greeks. After all, the <clears throat> ideology and psychology of identity and alterity are, in many respects, unstable. <clears throat> they change and are plasmated according to the changing challenges of life. And yet, they make, uh, they make a claim to absolute and lasting validity. This is what makes them dangerous. To come to a conclusion, from this short outlook, <clears throat> I would propose to draw three uh, <clears throat> conclusions, two for scholarship, one for ourselves. First, as historians, we should make use of the notion of identity in a precise sense, in order to avoid fashionable but useless generalizations. Whatever terms we adopt, we must distinguish between descriptions of cultural profiles and ideologies of selfness. Second, if we deal as historians with emphatic identity, we must be aware of the fact that this is not an innocent anthropological right, but a conscious constructed claim implying ambivalent consequences of exclusion and <coughs> conflict. Third, with regard to the present, we should not make ourselves guilty of promoting a category of social consciousness that leads to exclusion and conflict. What we need is social coherence um, and uh, mutual solidarity beyond and against identities. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that very, uh, another very rich paper. I'm sure there will be questions. Uh, yes. Is there a microphone? I'm, I'm a bit hesitant because you quoted me <laughs> during your talk that might be a bit uh, sus. But oh, uh, thank you very much, Tonio, for your talk. And uh, uh, I was particularly impressed that you had such a kind of methodological approach that you uh, focused mainly or only on objects, on material objects. So it's about a part of our evidence concerning identity and identity of the Greeks. Uh, but there are, of course, other elements uh, who uh, can serve as evidence for collective identities, like, for instance, language or rituals. So uh, we, and you spoke of Greeks before the Persian Wars. And the question is, uh, and perhaps material culture is not enough to uh, to. Uh, draw clear uh, ideas or conclusions or results about collective identity. We have to take into consideration literature uh, performances, as we heard in the talk before. And uh, we, this is the reason why we normally uh, see the symposium as a special Greek experience. But if Greek, Greek identity in the end, started only with the Persian Wars. Why are we, uh, why can we speak of Greeks concerning peoples, populations gathered around the Mediterranean from Spain and to the Black Sea and to Southern Russia as Greeks? Uh, the material culture uh, shows that this is probably, that this is very complicated. And I think according to the material culture, we would have very, very, very great difficulties to, to speak of Greeks. 
But I think we have to take into consideration other elements and other pieces of evidence that are relevant and <laughs> perhaps more relevant for a common feeling of belonging uh, as for instance material culture, probably rites, rituals, in the sense we heard of, of Lucia, and uh, languages and uh, shared, shared traditions and so on. Thank you. Of course you are right. <clears throat> and uh, I mean some of the phenomena you uh, you referred to were in those um, in those slides I skipped uh, in in order to <clears throat> stay in time. Uh, what I mean is, of course, that what I explained uh, or tried to explain uh, <clears throat> on the basis of material culture uh, can be transferred to other realms of uh, of uh, culture and. Uh, the problem, say, of language or athletics or the symposium. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, too, we have to distinguish, I think, in my view, uh, between a um, what I call descriptive, a factual uh, um, <clears throat> profile, cultural profile, and the definition as an uh, as an uh, undestroyable, uh, conscious uh, uh, property of identity. Yeah? This is, uh, these are two, two levels which of course can't be separated, but which make a big difference uh, uh, in, in terms of consciousness. Yeah? And so of course the, the, the Greeks used their language uh, uh, as uh, as a different tool from the languages of other cultures. Yeah, what I mean is uh, the difference between language as a, as a tool and language as uh, uh, as a uh, as an element of uh, emphatic uh, identity. Yeah. And this, uh, I think this is, you can make everything. I mean, uh, the, the, the opposition of Lance and Bow, yeah, which we saw in this, uh, also in this image. Yeah? Lances were used uh, and bows were used yeah, uh, in archaic times. Yeah? But in the fifth century, they were declared to be uh, symbols of Greek versus alien uh, identity. And that is uh, the point I, I was uh, trying to. Uh, and I think this can be transferred to, to, to all other uh, 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 sections of, uh, uh, of culture. Um, yes, um, perhaps last question, Marguerite. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. So uh, interesting talk, but uh, I would like to continue the argument uh, um, of, of Professor. Gerke. What? It's not just a language. What about uh, Greek self-consciousness, which is uh, well attested well before the Persian was the Olympic Games, for example, and the term Panhellenic. It starts uh, somewhere in the eighth century. It's Homer and uh, Padelenic competitions, Olympia, Delphi, etc., etc. And this is uh, an external expression of self-consciousness. It was, sometimes it was aggressively exclusive, like, like this story with the uh, Macedonian Prince Alexander, that, uh, uh, who was not admitted because uh, they claimed that he is not uh, Helen, uh, etc. But it, uh, I, I agree with you that before the Persian Wars, it was not antagonistic uh, towards the other world, but it was self self conscious, I think. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I agree. 
And uh, I mean, as Jonathan Hall has uh, shown in his books, uh, there was an increasing uh, development towards uh, uh, consciousness of, uh, of what is Greek and what, is, uh, what are other cultures. Yeah? Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, here too, it, uh, I think it uh, depends uh, or we should make differences between the emphasis given uh, to these uh, to these differences which makes them uh, uh, more and more um, problematic yeah? uh, <clears throat> and uh, of course uh, there were um, panhellenic uh, um, games yeah? uh, from which others were I don't know whether they were excluded, but they did not participate at least. Yeah? I don't know, uh, perhaps Joachim uh, Achim Gerke knows of examples uh, where this became uh, a conflictual situation. I don't know of anything, but <clears throat> on the other hand, I just uh, uh, remember or remind you of the fact that uh, uh, in sixth century, an Athenian aristocrat could easily name his uh, his son Croesus uh, <clears throat> without any without changing uh, without any problems with identity. Yeah, so um, I think this is uh, this is uh, perhaps not an absolute uh, divide, but uh, a kind of gradual uh, emphasization. Uh, and uh, ideological uh, 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 an increase of ideological uh, emphasis that uh, we uh, that we are witnessing, observing. Yes, Walter Pohl speaks of salience. Um, sometimes identity is salient; it jumps out. Uh, yeah. Um, Time is doing what time tends to do, so we must move on. But thanks once more to Tony O'Hulsher. And so we move to our final uh, speaker for the whole conference, well, final formal speaker at least, who is uh, Richard Yanko, who is going to be talking to us about uh, using the future to illuminate the past. Uh, Kelly Marisas. Uh, Lipame prepinamut na na po san vavarofonos. As I'm the last speaker of this series, um, I should like most warmly to thank uh, the uh, organizers of this splendid conference for inviting me and for hosting us all on such an enjoyable and I, I believe productive occasion. Um, technologies of increasing complexity from the control of fire to the invention of computers have always been integral to the advance of civilization as well as to the multiplication of its problems. Um, we animals called humans uh, have long since passed the stage of throwing verbal insults uh, at each other or sticks and stones, uh, progressing to firing off tweets or missiles instead. Inspired by the rediscovery of the atomic physics of Democritus, technology has brought us the power not just of Zeus's uh, thunderbolts themselves, uh, uh, not just of Prom Prometheus' spark of fire, but of Zeus's thunderbolts and indeed of worse things. The past will only have a future if humanity has a future. By making his Iliad end with Priam and Achilles, Homer shows us that true greatness means overcoming war and hatred in favor of our shared humanity. Even our seemingly worst enemy may one day be our friend. Ultimately, we are all mortal beings unable to live forever like Homer's gods. This is the only collective identity that should matter. The forces of unreason which I think we should call barbarism, lie deep in our human nature, as Thucydides well knew. For humanity to be able successfully to resist those forces, we continue to need, perhaps even more than before, 
the intellectual resources provided by the study of the ancient Mediterranean, especially the contributions of the Greeks, which need to be a possession forever, a ktema eis ae. We have heard many reasons from other speakers why this remains true. My own two favorites are these. Um, the first is the adaptation of the Phoenician script into a proper alphabet, a technology which accurately encodes human speech by representing each distinct phoneme of natural language, including the vowels, um, by using a different sign for each. This invention occurred before 800 BC, and since the earliest known inscription in Greek has been found in Italy at Gabii near Rome, and seems to date from 825, I think the alphabet was actually invented in Italy, at Pithecusae on the island of Ischia near Naples. Um, among the very large community of Hellenes and Phoenicians who lived together in um, apparent great harmony that together there. And uh, it was soon to spread both to Greece and to Rome, meaning that the Roman alphabet, the Western one, is, is practically as old as the Greek one. By making writing simple and accurate so that anyone could use it, the alphabet enabled the transformation uh, of oral literature into written form and the development of texts of all kinds, from verses like these on Nestor's cup to sophisticated philosophical arguments in prose. Above all, the invention of a true alphabet enabled easy communication between people in very far-flung places and in very different times, uh, even, in this case, across millennia, vastly expanding human consciousness. Such progress need not be permanent. If just one generation fails to learn to read properly, but reverts to relying on talk and images and emojis, uh, much rationality will be lost just as it was when the clumsy literacy of the Aegean Bronze Age, already an advance on the systems of the Near East, was lost in the catastrophic collapse of Mycenaean palatial society, a period with which I see many parallels in our own time. Um, but that's the topic for another lecture. In our, word, our world, this risks happening not only if civilization uh, uh, were to dramatically collapse, but because people's minds, people's brains are being rotted and hollowed out by social media and smartphones. The second great innovation that we owe to the Hellenes is the development of mechanisms for diffusing political power and preventing its excessive concentration in the hands of small groups or single persons, whatever may be their merits, uh, uh, or indeed their crimes. Um, and uh, we do not need all the practices of radical Athenian democracy in order to avoid letting one man centralize power in his own hands. Though, as Josh Ober showed us in his lecture, Athenian democracy did actually uh, uh, work as a very effective political system. But one mechanism we could really use uh, these days, uh, really overdue for revival, is ostracism. Uh, the lack of existence of such mechanisms or their failure has been the greatest barrier to human flourishing, turning history into a long and dismal parade of despots. The diversity of constitutions of the city-states of ancient Hellas, all the way back to early Sparta or 7th century Crete, um, whether these states, uh, as studied by Aristotle, depended on enslaved labor, like Sparta or Chios, uh, or uh, had increasing levels of equality before the law, 
um, and the nature of the histories of those states that resulted from those choices are essential knowledge for humankind. The all too easy reversion of the Hellenistic model following the Macedonian system to government by kings, the violent transformation of the Roman Republic, uh, which uh, diffused a lot of power among uh, the Kiwes Romani into autocracies that may have been at first enlightened, uh, but soon ceased to be so, and as a result declined, continued on to the detriment of republic republics for 1,500 years. The slide backward to tyranny, evident in the last 100 years, with its ever-increasing risks to the survival of civilization and of the planet, uh, should serve to remind us that freedom has to be fought for um, internally and uh, internationally for every, by every generation as it was here in Athens 25 centuries ago. Human freedom will only continue if humans are taught and inspired by the history of, past, of that struggle and of others like it, and that they learn the many ways in which our societies can be made to work better, not all according to one model, but better than they will work if they're run by hate mongers and tyrants. But today I want to focus on what the modern fruits of ancient science can teach us that is new about the ancient world. It's commonly thought that classical scholars are plowing old fields that can uh, yield no new discoveries and that the best we can do uh, to keep the plants in the field growing and relevant to the wider public is to reinterpret uh, the past in terms of the ever-changing uh, world of the present. That is highly important, but it's not the only thing we can do. International cooperation in sharing the fruits of scientific advance can also add much to our knowledge of antiquity. Classical scholars have long been in the forefront of this effort. For instance, methods developed for cryptography in World War II um, and a network of international collaborators were essential for Michael Ventris's decipherment of the Linear B tablets as the earliest form of Greek. During that time, Classicists like my teacher, John Chadwick, worked alongside mathematicians like Alan Turing to develop new methods for code breaking, like computers. He invented the computer, as we know, in 1936. Um, it was only, of course, in 2006 that scientists put the ancient Antikythera mechanism through computerized high-resolution X-ray tomography and discovered that the analog computer was not actually invented by Alan Turing or by Babbage in the 19th century, um, but had already been invented before in antiquity, but we had forgotten because progress is not uh, a smooth forward march. In the days when a digital file was still a stack of punch cards or a reel of paper tape, uh, classicists were already using these resources to shed new light on old texts. David Packard founded the um, Thesaurus Linguae Graecae database of ancient Greek texts as early as 1972, and that project was far ahead of its time. Before the TLG had become available, other than as a few uh, machines in a very few places, a Scottish clergyman interested in statistical stylometry, actually for sorting out the authenticity of letters of St. Paul, um, the Reverend A.Q. Morton uh, had already created the first machine-readable texts of all sorts of Greek works, including Homer and Hesiod. Uh, on the advice of John Chadwick, who put me in touch as a student with uh, the Reverend Morton, um, I used his texts to create and print out a keyword in context concordance to all, all of early Greek epic back in 1977, 
I still have the stack of printouts. Um, on that basis, uh, statistical analysis of the frequency of archaic elements in the epic language showed that the Homeric poems are earlier than those of Hesiod. Again, this is implying, uh, employing a uh, new uh, scientific approach. But I want to focus on how recent progress in another technology made possible by computing, digital imaging, is contributing to our knowledge of the ancient world in interesting ways. Hellenistic scientists like Archimedes and Hipparchus had made extraordinary advances in understanding the solar system. And they applied the latest skills in engineering to this problem in order to create that first analog computer, um, uh, the unique mechanism that was found by divers on the seabed off the coast of Antikythera in 1901. But it was only through advances in X-ray imaging that we learned this. The historians Derek de Sola Price at Yale and recently Mike Edmonds and David Freeth in uh, uh, the uh, whatever I should call Britain, um, I was going to say the United Kingdom, um, have used digital X-ray tomography to see inside the encrusted interior of the mechanism. Revealed, uh, they revealed that its gears were machined to an accuracy that was only achieved again during World War II. High-resolution surface scanning has now revealed that the user manual engraved on the outside of the box used the Corinthian or Syracusan calendar, which links it to Archimedes in some sense, although it certainly uses calculations that were only developed by Hipparchus uh, half a century later. The progress on, in the digital imaging of texts largely came about through uh, NASA's efforts to map distant planets, places so remote from the sun that hardly any light ever reaches them. Image enhancement has recently been used to decipher the writing that lies under a number of palimpsests, yielding parts of new texts by the comic poet Menander, the scientist Archimedes, as in my slide, um, the orator Hyperides, and uh, most recently, very exciting for me, um, uh, book, uh, parts of book 23, of the Orphic Rhapsodies, um, which are in a codex uh, at St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai. In the late 1990s, a team at Brigham Young University, led by Steve and Susan Boris, applied multispectral uh, digital imaging to the carbonized library of the philosophical Greek texts from Herculaneum, in which black ink lies on blackened papyrus, making the, the papyri almost illegible to the human eye. However, as you can see, in the infrared spe uh, spectrum, the ink is readily uh, uh, visible, and they imaged the entire collection in 1999. These images have revolutionized the study of the 600 Herculaneum papyri, that were opened uh, physically in the 18th and 19th centuries. Such images enable these texts to be properly read and edited, often for the first time. And when uh, they're combined with advanced mathematical techniques, uh, they also let us reconstruct some of these um, uh, ancient books almost in their entirety. Um, starting off uh, with Daniel de Latre's reconstruction of Philodemus on Music 4. And he was the first to develop uh, the uh, mathematics, uh, the, the system of putting the fragments in the right order. Uh, uh, meanwhile, I've reconstructed four books of Philodemus's on poems, the latest one containing 222 columns of text, of which about 150 still remain. A refinement of such techniques, hyperspectral imaging, has enabled uh, Killian Fleischer uh, to read more accurately Philodemus's uh, History of Plato's Academy, where the author himself 
uh, added on the back of the original draft uh, passages for inclusion in uh, a subsequent further draft on the back of the papyrus roll. And the new technology has enabled Fleischer to read the passages written on the back of uh, this uh, 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 sheet. And this sheds an interesting light on how ancient books were actually uh, composed. Many further discoveries await us from Herculaneum. If only more scholars would summon up the courage to work on this difficult material, which demands a good knowledge of the ancient language. 200 or so Herculaneum rolls remain unopened. Uh, these are three of them. Computer scientist Brent Seals of the University of Kentucky and his team are using digital x-ray tomography in an effort to read the ink on the interiors of these rolled up papyri. Seals had already demonstrated in 2015 that he could achieve this on the interior of a leather scroll. Uh, that was found at Engedi in Israel in 1972. Um, uh, this scroll, uh, he, he managed to flatten out digitally um, after scanning it with X-ray computer tomography. And it turns out to be the opening of the Book of Leviticus, the oldest copy uh, known of that work. But the ink in this particular scroll contains iron, um, which is easier to reveal with x-rays, whereas most ancient scrolls have carbon-based ink made of soot, although they do seem to contain surprising amounts of lead, uh, which is nice. At a conference in California just before the pandemic, 2019, Seals proved that he could train a computer by machine learning to recognize uh, visible carbon-based ink in Herculaneum papyri that have already been opened. The image on the top left is the photograph of the tiny fragment that was used for this purpose. Um, and uh, the sigma uh, uh, seen by X-ray tomography at the bottom right is not uh, certainly as sharp as the one in the photo at the top left, but it clearly becomes legible as you can train the computer to recognize that ink. Seals and his team have now been able to resume their work, and this has been helped by the reopening of the Officina dei Papiri in Naples. Um, and uh, it was interrupted, of course, by the pandemic. His images are getting sharper all the time. He sent me this image uh, last week. Um, the image on the left uh, is an infrared photo made by the uh, Brigham Young team. The image on the center is what his X-ray tomography at first showed, and the image on the right, um, uh, uh, plus ink ID is what that stands for, um, is uh, showing you how the computer uh, comes to recognize the ink. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, fragment uh, has two layers. Uh, you can probably see that the lines of writing are not the same distance apart. Um, and uh, the upper layer at uh, the, the top uh, uh, overlies the lower one at the bottom, as you can see on the infrared photograph on the left. The image in the middle and on the right are both scans made with X-ray tomography. And at the right, you're beginning to see more of the lower layer uh, than you can see on the left. Um, that letter that uh, Seals uh, circled for us um, uh, uh, looks very like an epsilon in this handwriting and uh, is probably, or maybe a theta, I, I suppose it should be theta. Um, anyway, um, uh, uh, there's uh, more of it appearing. This uh, gain of one hidden letter may seem like a very small thing, but it proves that Seal's method is going to work and that we will eventually be able to read the scrolls that have not yet been opened 
which are very numerous. It's only a matter of time before we acquire digitally the texts of a couple of hundred new uh, philosophical works. I expect these to be in a somewhat better state of preservation than the existing corpus of Herculaneum texts. Other spin-offs from these uh, uh, technologies provide new information too. In 2014, I studied the Devaney Papyrus in the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki. The Devaney Papyrus is not only carbonized, like the Herculaneum papyri, but it has been mounted under glass, um, and the glass is a problem. Um, uh, we, they are not mounted under glass. Its fragments are practically illegible in ordinary light. The glass means that conventional photographs taken through it uh, with a conventional microscope, such as papyrologists normally use, are plagued with terrible reflections. Even infrared uh, images, such as those made by the BYU team in 2006, uh, turned out to be less good than normal. Um, this is the only one that uh, uh, the museum in Thessaloniki has. While I gazed at, in despair at the blackened fragments, an archaeologist who was working at the next desk in the laboratory among all the potsherds and uh, bronze vessels, um, Demosthenes Kekaias, um, offered uh, to help me. He lent me uh, a very basic, cheap USB digital microscope. He was using it to study and photograph 6th century BC textiles which had survived in a tomb in Macedonia. Um, at first, the reflections from the glass were almost as terrible as before, but eventually I found that if I brought the head of the microscope right down onto the level of the glass, the reflections still appear around the edge of the image, but they leave an area in the middle without them. And if you um, put uh, uh, different uh, images together by digitally stitching them, you can actually get far better images of the papyrus um, uh, than before. Um, uh, so uh, one has to take thousands of tiny microphotographs, but they do yield superior photography without having to open the glass, which is obviously out of the question. My 5,000 images enabled a better reconstruction of the heavily damaged opening columns, which are on the cult of the Irinias. Um, a second set of 5,000 images in the infrared spectrum, uh, shown in the upper of those two images, revealed letters, uh, many letters that do not even appear in the uh, visible light photographs. Three other papyri are at least as old as the Devaney papyrus. And the Devaney papyrus, by the way, is older than uh, someone uh, earlier said. I'm certain it was written uh, no later than 360 uh, BCE. Um, the late 5th century uh, uh, Daphne papyrus on the left, uh, dating, I thought, from 425, I'm very happy to learn it's a bit earlier, containing lyric poetry, which was published by Martin West and Joanna Karamanu, as we heard from her um, in this uh, conference. Uh, a second one from the tomb of uh, Philip II of Macedon in Vergina, in Pieria, on the upper, upper right. And a third one from Mangalia in Romania, uh, ancient Calatis. Um, since none of these papyri were carbonized, they survive only as smaller fragments, mostly very small fragments. The survival of the Colatus papyrus was particularly miraculous. It was found under a huge slab um, uh, as a complete roll in a Macedonian-style tomb in 1959. Uh, we are told that it disintegrated upon exposure to damp and air, and it was said to have disappeared completely. 
In fact, its remnants had been taken to Moscow for conservation, uh, where it was tracked down and uh, uh, rediscovered and returned to Romania in 2010. Um, uh, having, uh, by a very remote uh, uh, line of connections, learned that it still existed, um, I managed to track it down um, and uh, tried to photograph its 224 tiny fragments. With ordinary light, I could see hardly any ink. Only with digital infrared micro microphotography did the writing appear. The polyvinyl acetate um, and the body of the deceased um, uh, had uh, darkened the fragments. Although only detached words survive, there are enough words to show that this role contained an epic poem in Doric dialect um, about the Persian Empire. Um, uh, the name Artaxerxes uh, uh, is uh, pretty hard to dispute. Um, the meter seems to be dactylic. Um, uh, I suspect it may be uh, the, the Persica of Coirulus, um, uh, but it seems there is contradiction about what dialect Coirulus wrote in. Um, the uh, content of this papyrus is less important, however, than the fact of its existence. Its existence confirms a statement in Xenophon in his Anabasis as he marched through the Thracian coastline uh, in 400 BCE. Um, uh, he says that many written papyrus rolls were among the loot that the Thracians of Salmodessus plunder from wrecks on the coast of the southwest Black Sea. And Tausa, Heuriskonto, Poloi Menklinai, Polade Kibotia, Polide Bibloi Gegramenai, Kaitala Pola, Hossa en Xulinois Teuchesi, now Cleroi Agusin. A pretty clear statement that the books were not just empty rolls of papyrus, they actually had content written on them. A joint project between the University of Southampton um, and uh, the Bulgarians, the Black Sea uh, MAP project, or EEF Expeditions, um, has recently been exploring the seabed of the Black Sea for remains of ancient shipping. Among their discoveries was uh, the perfectly preserved, this perfectly preserved wreck, which, as 5th century BC vase paintings prove, belongs to that century. When, during remote prehistory, post-glacial sea levels rose as a result of the melting of the glaciers um, uh, so much that salt water flowed through the Bosporus into the Black Sea, the heavier salt water from the Mediterranean um, sank below the fresh water of what had been the greatest freshwater lake in the world. And that salt water, um, which was heavier, lost all of its oxygen. And as a result, these waters in which this wreck remains are anoxic. Uh, they contain no oxygen to support any marine life at depths below 100 meters. They have to be explored by robots. These conditions preserve shipwrecks far better than anywhere else in the oceans. Among the cargoes that we may hope someday uh, to find perfectly preserved and to recover should be boxes of books such uh, like those which Xenophon records. There are thus two places in the world where we may hope to recover substantially more of the lost libraries of antiquity. And as we explored in uh, an earlier paper, material remains don't speak from the past in the same way that books do. That first place is Herculaneum, where more excavations at the Villa of the Papyri are urgently needed before Vesuvius erupts again and covers the site with lava for the third time in 2,000 years. Where they were trying to remove the library when the eruption happened. There are carrying boxes for books found in the villa. And 
there should be more library. Uh, what we have is just the collection of Philodemus, not the great R Greek and Roman library that a great noble like uh, Cnaeus Calpurnius Piso, the father-in-law of Julius Caesar, must have had. And this library was preserved in a place which guaranteed its presentation, pr preservation. The second place where we should look is the bottom of the Black Sea. There will be Roman books and Byzantine manuscripts on parchment down there as well, if only we can recover them. There is much more to discover. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard. That was absolutely fascinating and a wonderful way to end the conference. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions, but I'm sure you can catch Richard uh, afterwards during the coffee break. But now I'm going to hand over to Theodore Papangelis uh, for some final words. Sorry, but sore throats have to be irrigated. It is obvious that there have been, and still there are, external pressures which generate the need for a classicist, Prodomo Sua, not required of, of other supposedly more relevant disciplines. Yet the renegotiation of the value and prospects of classics is also the result of intramuros developments, and we have heard a lot about them in these last days. Etched on my memory, from my postgraduate days in the Cambridge of the early 80s is a metaphor deployed by Tony Woodman and David West in the epilogue of a slim collective volume under the title Quality and Pleasure in Latin Poetry, published in 1974. Referring to the explosion of theories in the 20th century and their impact on Latin scholarship, they wax epico-lyrical. I quote, We have heard the rumblings of the great critical storms of the century, and the waves have beaten on our shores. But have they reshaped the coastline? End of quotes. In the light of hindsight, what the two classical scholars sensed back then was no more than a fresh breeze from the quarters of new criticism. And little did they know that more was on the way from the aeolian recesses of theory. Venti velut agmine facto, qua data porta rund et omnia turbine perflant. Structuralism, with its surplus of coats, semiotic officiations, Boas deconstructors, feminist postcolonial and cultural lucubrations, new historicisms, philosophies of materialism, ever expanding contextualizations, and sprawling recontextualizations. Beyond what one might see as under-theorized tame formalism, as against an over-theorized surrender to the abstractions of theory. The new reality is one of radically changing perceptions, perspectives, and agendas, which work to reevaluate notions and ideas about what constitutes the classic, about the classical tradition and its European Western exclusivities, and especially about the crucial question of value, which is inextricably bound up 
with our discipline's durability. In other words, with the future of the classical past, both at the institutional level and within the broader cultural sphere. The last three days have reflected some, if not all, of the reorientations I am referring to. Although it seems to me that no tectonic movement considerably high on the Richter scale was registered, simply because the causa efficiens eventually declined our invitation. It is, I believe, a good thing that several papers unfolded a subtle argument oriented towards the future without forfeiting the idea of the classical past's persistent exemplarity in dealing with such important issues as the strategic reasoning, the dissolution of the unitary self, the prevailing educational utilitarianism, or the medical ethics. Intelligently reckoned with the issue of the past's exemplarity, even if you happen to disagree with its perceived effects, imparts to the discourses of classical scholarship an interest all of their own. It is also a good thing to hear, as we have heard, that the classical tradition can be much more than the glorified foundation of a Western identity and can function as a catalyst for critical and pluralist reflection, not only on differences, but also on the universals, so to speak, uh, shared by other major civilizations and traditions of thought. It is also good for our intellectual vigilance to be reminded, and we have been reminded, that our classical texts are versatile enough to foreshadow or reflect our modern concerns and anxieties, while holding the promise that, subjected to ever new readings, they will continue to do so in the future. A future which, as a couple of papers have reassured us, will see the grand dame of classical scholarship marching hand in hand with the technology savvies towards new horizons and experiences. To sustain the sailing metaphor, hazards may be lurking along the reshaped coastline. From the neglect of a solid classical training to the sloppy or cavalier treatment of our textual material, or to a fundamentalist relativism driven by ideological obsessions. Yet I'm confident that on balance, our classical studies stand to gain a future which in many respects will be more rich, more inclusive, more exciting, more interconnected and interactive with other fields of knowledge and research. Antiquity, as we know and have heard, is both familiar and alien. And its fascination is that while it commands a certain amount of pious genuflections before a demonstrably formative past, it also has a knack for constantly and refreshingly contributing to our modernity and its evolving conceptual mechanisms. And because it involves the students in narratives of mandatory diachrony, it is also unique in shaping an intellect capable of better understanding the constructedness and historicity of cultural phenomena. Beyond the celebrations of antiquity's classical value, it is, I think, its heuristic cultural value that seems more likely to ensure what we have been musing upon these last three days, the future of its past. 
And now, as the splendors of the Acropolis Museum, minus the Parthenon marbles, are awaiting us, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to express warm thanks to all those who, over the last months, worked with unfailing devotion for the best possible result in preparing our conference. Thanks to the board of directors of the Costas and Eleni Urani Foundation, to the Secretary General of the Academy of Athens, Professor Christos Zerefos, to the co-organizer of the conference, Professor Yorgos Yanakis, to the director of the Center for the Study of Greek and Latin Antiquity, the Academy Center for the Study of Greek and Latin Antiquity, Professor Thanasis Stefagis, and the Center's researchers. To Ms. Eleni Bita and Ms. Eleni Kondoe from the Department of Financial Administration of the Academy, to our technical support team, and last but not least, to Ms. Tekla Paraskevudi from the Academy's Public Relations Office. Finally, and in the hope that your Athenian days, both inside and outside the Academy building, did not fall short of your scholarly, aesthetic, or even meteorological expectations, I want once again to address our sincere thanks to each and every one of you for making this week one to be marked with a white stone. Thank you very much. Καλημέρα σας. Μπορούμε, όπως ακούσαμε από τον κύριο α, Παπαγγελή, να μιλάμε για ώρες, για μέρες, για μήνες, για πολύ ακόμα χρόνο, για το μέλλον του παρελθόντος. Ίσως εσαΐ. Ελπίζομαι όμως ότι κάποια πρώτα συμπεράσματα για το που βρισκόμαστε αυτή τη στιγμή, έχουν προκύψει από τις εργασίες αυτής της συνάντησης. Ελπίζομαι επίσης να είστε όλοι ικανοποιημένοι από την εκδήλωση αυτή. Εμείς από τη μεριά μας σας ευχαριστούμε όλους και όλες για την παρουσία σας στους χώρους του συνεδρίου ή στις διαδικτυακές συνδέσεις σας και για τη συμβολή σας στην επιτυχία των εργασιών αυτής της α, συνάντησης. Ξεχωριστές ευχαριστίες οφείλονται στους ομιλητές, οι οποίοι με τη γνώση και τη σοφία τους διαφώτισαν πολλές πτυχές οι οποίες αφορούν το παρελθόν του παρόντος. Το παρελθόν, το παρόν και κυρίως το μέλλον των κλασικών και φιλολογικών σπουδών. Θα θέλαμε επίσης να ευχαριστήσουμε τους συνεργάτες και ερευνητές της Ακαδημίας Αθηνών, καθώς και τους τεχνικούς μας, οι οποίοι με την επιμέλεια και τη γνώση τους διασφάλισαν την ομαλή προετοιμασία και διαξαγωγή των εργασιών του συνεδρίου. Επίσης θα θέλαμε να ευχαριστήσουμε το Μουσείο της Ακρόπολης για τη φιλοξενία της σημερινής συνεδρίας. Τέλος, όπως γνωρίζετε, σύμφωνα με το πρόγραμμα, θα ακολουθήσει μια ξενάγηση στους χώρους και στα εκθέματα του Μουσείου από τον καθηγητή κ. Μανώλη Κορέ, τον οποίο ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ και από καρδιάς για την προσφορά να μας προσφέρει μια έγκυρη και έγκριτη ε, ξενάγηση στους χώρους του Μουσείου. Για όσους ταξιδεύετε, ευχόμαστε καλή και ασφαλή επιστροφή στην έδρα σας και σύντομα εις το επανειδήν. And an announcement, dash reminder, exactly at 12 o'clock we should all gather by the entrance of the museum 
for the tour guide. Thank you. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Γεια σας.